Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro and I'm a Portfolio Analyst with TRICOM. TRICOM is pleased to introduce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of this series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our presenter today is John Rutledge. John is an employee benefits consultant and insurance broker with over 30 years of professional insurance experience. In John's role as Vice President at Assurance Agency, he acts as a senior benefits consultant and broker with the firm's staffing practice. John is a leader in Assurance Agency's initiative to develop health insurance plans and programs for staffing companies under the ACA with a focus on controlling costs, using advanced risk strategies for health plans such as captives. John advises employers on all aspects of the management and funding of their employee benefits program. He is a strong believer in strategic benefit planning to make sure the firm's employee benefits align with and support its organizational, financial, and HR goals. Assurance Agency is among the nation's largest and most awarded independent insurance brokerages and is by far the lar largest insurance broker for the staffing industry. Assurance proudly services nearly 500 staffing firms representing them in all lines of insurance, business and personal insurance, workers' compensation, internal staff benefits, and benefits for temporary staff. Founded in 1961, Assurance is headquartered in Schaumburg, Illinois, where insurance professionals provide analysis, advice, and service to thousands of clients nationwide. In today's Industry Insider webinar, John will discuss the employer mandate delay and what this means for your staffing firm. In addition to that, John will provide information on the true cost of paying or playing. By the end of this session, you'll have the information you need to prepare your staffing firm for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. I will now turn the floor over to John. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Uh, do we have the, uh, Amanda, I'm not seeing the PowerPoint presentation uh, in front of me. Is that up? It should be up. Um, go ahead and click on the top tab that says Tricom Webinar if you're not seeing that. Yeah, I'm getting the Tricom slides. And then there should be a tab right next to that on the right, if you could click onto that one. There we go. I apologize for the uh, technical uh, glitch there. But again, thank you uh, very much for that introduction, Amanda, and, and uh, just to restate um, who I am and, and who I'm with, Assurance Agency is a large privately held insurance broker. Uh, what we are really known for is our presence in the staffing industry. We are by a long shot the largest insurance broker for staffing companies. Uh, we represent uh, close to 500 staffing companies with a national footprint. So. Uh, my role is I am an employee benefits consultant and insurance broker. Um, many, if not all of you, probably work with an insurance broker doing employee benefits for your internal staff. Well, that's what I do. What makes me different is uh, I work with nothing but staffing companies as clients. So what you'll find is we understand staffing as an industry. We understand the Affordable Care Act and how it applies to you. Today, uh, what I hope that we're able to accomplish, what I'd like for you to take away, is understand more about the, the delay that's been announced and what really has changed, maybe even more about what hasn't changed. Uh, even though we're probably very tired of, of hearing about the Affordable Care Act, I think it's extremely important that staffing companies really understand the key provisions of that act and how it will impact your business <clears throat> and even your customer's business. Uh, one of those items is how you as business owners view and how you administer employee benefits will almost certainly change, and, and that is something you just really need to, to, uh, to embrace. Unfortunately, business costs are going up. They're going up for all of us. 
but it is a uh, an expense that we believe can be managed effectively and actually even something that can be leveraged uh, should you choose to do it to grow your business. Uh, I want you to remember to focus on three things. Cost, obviously, is enormous, uh, but also compliance and the administration. Those are two aspects of this law that you really, really want to be able to have uh, under the microscope. So whatever decisions you make are really going to impact your operations and probably your profitability, even top line, as well as expense management in the the coming years. So we've all heard about the delay. What in the world happened? Well, this was almost like we had... um, a sudden interruption in a television program where we were told there was a special announcement uh, that was coming. Uh, On a blog post on the Treasury Department's uh, website on July 2nd, there was an announcement that there was going to be uh, a delay. And in fact, uh, there has been a delay. But the question is exactly what has been delayed? Well, uh, the um, Affordable Care Act Uh, among other things, wrote a new section into the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, Section 6055 uh, requires reporting uh, by employers and issuers of health insurance. Um, And a similar section, 6056, uh, went hand-in-hand with 6055. Now, the reporting requirements uh, were not in place. The IRS said they didn't see how they would have them in place in time, and that's what uh, initially started the delay and what was delayed. It's important that you understand a little bit about what sections 6055 and 6056 are, because while the reporting itself has been delayed, we see nothing that's going to change the requirement that reporting uh, occur, because they've been written into law. And specifically, uh, each Uh, employer through their insurance issuer or on their own is going to have to report things like the name, address, taxpayer uh, identification number of the primary insured employee and each other individual covered under minimum essential coverage during the calendar year. Um, And in the case of health insurance coverage, whether the coverage uh, is qualified Uh, and offered through an exchange, or if the coverage is qualified through the exchange, any penalties or subsidies that are associated with that. In addition, the terms, conditions of your health care coverage provided to your full-time employees for the year, and information on your full-time employees, including those who did receive coverage and when they received it. There's a lot of information that you're going to be reporting uh, as a result of, of this act. Now, because the reporting requirements were delayed, and because the reporting mechanisms are the means by which the IRS tracks and collects the penalties, the $2,000 and $3,000 penalties we've heard so much about, the penalties have also been delayed. Hence, uh, what we've heard is the employer mandate itself has been delayed, and and really that's that's actually true. Uh, I won't argue with that. Uh, Technically, it's the reporting and the the penalties. even though the administration is encouraging voluntary compliance of, in terms of the expansion of health benefits and reporting, the reality is you're not required uh, to do that until 2015. So a uh, big sigh of relief, uh, take a deep breath, but wait, there's actually more. Because the bigger question is what hasn't changed? And there's a lot. So one of the things that I hope to do today, in addition to just educating you, is I hope to light a fire under you uh, because there's still a lot of action steps that you as business owners need to take. And one of them is coming up within uh, about 70 days, uh, and that is no later than actually prior to October 1st, you have to distribute what we're referring to as the model exchange notice to all of your current employees. Uh, and to new hires within 14 days of the start date. This notice requirement has not been delayed. You still have that on your plate. Uh, You also need to be able to track variable hour employees for 2014. 
which probably means that no later than November 1st of this year, you need that tracking mechanism in place. The Affordable Care Act is still the law of the land, um, and there's a lot of political banter going around uh, about it. Uh, but the reality is, while the House of Representatives has voted now 39 times to repeal or delay either all or part of the law, including just this last uh, Friday, uh, they voted to delay the individual mandate. The reality is the Senate hasn't even taken up the issue, and there's no indication that the Senate will take it up. Um, the exchanges are still scheduled to open on October 1st for coverage purchases on January 1st. Um, the individual subsidies will be available in 2014. In addition to that, those of you that have health reimbursement arrangements or other self-insured plans have PCORI fees due, potentially this July 31st. Uh, PCORI fee stands for Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, if you have a fully insured health plan, your health insurance company will pay that fee. But if you have a a self-insured health plan, which includes a health reimbursement arrangement. Now, I'm not talking about health spending accounts. That's different. And flexible spending accounts, those are different. But some employers have high deductible health plans where they reimburse a part of the deductible, and uh, that's called a health reimbursement arrangement, an HRA. Please be aware those fees are due, uh, depending on when those HRAs uh, renewed, may be due this, the end of this July, just a few days away. Uh, your health insurance costs are going up, unfortunately, because other fees and taxes that were built into the plan are still in position. Uh, for example, the health insurance industry tax, something your health insurance carrier is responsible for paying, and transitional reinsurance fees are going to be built into your health care premiums if you are a self-insured employer, and I don't know that anybody is uh, self-insured, uh, but if so, then you will need to uh, pay those fees directly. Um, also, insurance market reforms kick in place on January 1st of 2014. Um, you are no longer going to be able to provide longer than a 90-day waiting period for health coverage effective with your first renewal in 2014. Uh, no pre-existing condition exclusions can, can apply, and there can be no annual or lifetime maximums on certain health benefits. Each employer is going to be required to distribute a uh, summary of uh, benefits and coverage documents, and you'll have to make sure that your plan is changed to make sure that the definition of full-time employee is 30 hours per week, which by definition really means you want to have a plan document. Many of you probably don't have plan documents. That is not the same as an insurance policy. A plan document is a written legal document that governs the terms of your health plan. Um, so uh, there are implications of the delay that we want to make you aware of. Um, obviously, there are no penalty payment dollars that will occur uh, in 2014. Now that means Treasury will collect less money to fund the Affordable Care Act. Um, that will create a shortfall, and the question remains, how will that impact other aspects, if at all, of the Affordable Care Act, or will it simply be another uh, item that adds to our deficit? There is an opportunity that we have been given besides delaying our increased cost and that is we have the ability to see how the insurance carriers price health insurance in 2014. We've done a lot of forecasting and predicting as to what was going to happen to health insurance rates. Well, now we have the opportunity to actually see what happens in 2014. And I like that. That is good for business owners in terms of predicting your costs in 2015. However, there's another aspect to this that uh, we want to make you aware of, and that is your employees will still be able to go to the exchanges in 2014, obviously, 
And if you have not expanded coverage for those employees, your temps, they will qualify for subsidies depending on their income levels. So um, there is potential fallout that you need to be aware of in 2015. For example, those employers who receive subsidies next year and are not qualified for those same subsidies in 2015, because that's when you expand coverage, uh, you're going to get some, some noise from some of those employees. Uh, also, OSHA created a protected class for any employee who receives the subsidy. That, that is a very little known detail that occurred in March, and some lawyers that I've talked to don't even, aren't even aware of this. I don't know that it's going to create a major issue um, but you need to be aware of it, that any employee who goes and gets a subsidy is now protected under OSHA's whistleblower status. Um, so be prepared to deal with what could be unexpected uh, collateral um, damage, if you will. And the point for raising these issues is not to scare you. It's not to push you into thinking about adding coverage in 2014 instead of 2015. It's really uh, just so that you're aware and informed because you've got to make business decisions, and you can't make business decisions unless you know what's coming. So now we're back to our regularly scheduled programming to use our, our news bulletin analogy. Um, the reality is there is still a lot to do. And as I said earlier, I know that we're all very tired of, of seminars and webinars like this one and reading uh, letters and, and emails and bulletins, but uh, we really need to get back to dealing with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, further guidance on implementation has been promised from the administration, and based on past history, uh, I would say you may want to be watching the news wires on the Friday afternoon just before Labor Day weekend. That's, that means around 5 p.m. September 1st. The administration has a history of releasing their uh, announcements on the Affordable Care Act on the Friday before holiday weekends. The smart money is we're not going to see any further delays and that employers will be expected to fully implement no later than January 1, 2015, which means your last chance before then to put all the pieces in place will be your next health insurance renewal or the renewal in 2014. <clears throat> in the meantime, it will be politics as usual, and that means that uh, the House will continue to try and, and change this law. Uh, the Senate uh, will hope to sneak by through the midterm elections next year and retain control uh, by the Democrats. There is a lot of political rhetoric going on. A lot of the talking heads on the news channels are going to talk this up. Uh, but inside the Beltway, the words that we hear or the word we hear uh, is that don't expect further delays. Don't be fooled by what you hear the, the news outlets talking about. Uh, in fact, the administration is going to be selling this thing hard and promoting it uh, to the young and to the healthy in terms of buying coverage on the exchanges. So your, uh, your big question is when do I need to expand coverage? Uh, is there going to be collateral damage if I wait until Jan uh, January 1 of 2015? My recommendation is that you take this time to be preemptive and uh, risk manage uh, what's about to happen to you. So I'm going to get back into the high-level basics of the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to get deep in the weeds today. Uh, there are certain topics that I think have been overdone. I'll be glad to take questions at the end of today's program. If there's a topic that you don't feel uh, well enough informed about, but I want to try and keep this high-level. And the reality is the Affordable Care Act mandate, as we refer to it, really asks the, the question, are you a large employer or not? And a large employer, as I'm sure you know by now, is defined as having full-time plus full-time equivalents of at least 50. And 
any staffing firm of a substantial size is likely to eclipse the 50 full-time full -time equivalent mark on the average business day, which is the measure. So um, if you are not a large employer, um, you can probably tune out the, the most of this because there are other things that affect you, but not for the next several slides. If you are a large employer, you have only two options, as I'm sure you know, and that is you're either subject to paying the, the penalty or a penalty, which is a federal excise tax, or you must expand coverage. Uh, either way, as I said earlier, unfortunately your cost of doing business is going to go up. Uh, but the question is how much and how well you manage it will obviously impact your opportunity. Uh, there are, I am convinced, opportunities for staffing companies that uh, take advantage and know how to leverage this law uh, to grow their top line and to manage to profitability. So uh, let's take a look at each of the two options or what we refer to as uh, the, the pay or play uh, options. The <clears throat> minimum essential coverage requirement is the first penalty option that we, that we uh, have to cross. That is the $2,000 penalty that is assessed if you don't offer coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees. And the term minimum essential coverage, or MEC, is very important because that is the standard that you must meet or pay the $2,000 penalty. But even if you offer MEC, you're still not out of the woods because there is a second potential penalty. And that is a $3,000 penalty for each employee who qualifies for a subsidy. And in order to qualify for a subsidy, the plan that you offer as an employer um, has to fail one or both of the following two tests, and that is the minimum value test or the affordability test. So the key, I think, for each of you is to make sure that offering coverage includes uh, meeting the minimums and the tests um, and then work very, very closely with your broker. So you can and should, in my opinion, offer coverage that takes you out of all penalty situations simply by, uh, by making sure you're meeting the minimum value and affordability tests in addition to, to MAC. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what it means to play or pay and specifically the financial impact of each because, as I said earlier, you really have two options. Um, either offer coverage or pay a penalty. So we're going to look first at uh, our, our hypothetical staffing company, ABC Staffing, who has 30 internal employees, plus after the look back has been done, they have determined they have 150 full-time temps. So if they just pay the penalty, um, they escape the penalty on the first 30 employees. So they're going to pay a $2,000 penalty on 150 employees and doing the math, uh, that e equals $300,000. But as I'm sure you've, you've learned by now, we really have to take more into consideration because as an excise tax, that penalty is not tax deductible. So I'm going to assume that we have a 40% uh, combined federal and state income tax rate either by the business or perhaps it's a sub S and the owner has a 40% income tax. But uh, hopefully each of you are earning a profit and having to pay an income tax. I don't like the fact that you pay an income tax, but I hope you make a profit. And if you do, then you're paying income taxes. So in our 40% example, which is, is you can apply your own percents as either a business or individual, the actual impact to your P&L of that $2,000 penalty or $300,000 aggregate number is actually half a million dollars because to, to get the full impact, we divide that number by 0 .60. So that really comes out to be uh, over $3,000 per employee, not $2,000 per employee. Now, Instead of paying the penalty, what's the financial impact of offering coverage? Well, because 
health insurance is a tax deductible uh, business expense. Uh, we have to ask the question, what is my bogey for, for not exceeding the penalty number? The penalty number in our uh, taxpayer's example is $3,333. Well, the answer is after tax deductibility, we can afford, if you will, if you'll permit me to use that term, a $5,555 business expense that equals $3,333 after tax deductibility. So the break-even point for ABC staffing in terms of whether it makes sense to pay the penalty or to offer insurance is health coverage at uh, roughly $5,500 per employee per year versus the penalty. So the question you may be asking is, well, John, can I get health coverage for $5,555 per year? Well, let's remember that we're only required to, to measure this against our single health insurance rate. But there is another variable we haven't considered yet, and that is the fact that we are allowed to charge our employees part of the insurance cost. Remember, we can charge them up to 9.5% of their earnings. So if we look at, uh, just for, for argument's sake, an employee that makes roughly $15,000 a year, which is going to be, uh, depending on how many hours he or she works, close to 133% of the federal poverty level. And that's an important number because that's the break point in many states for qualifying for a subsidy. That means we could charge this particular employee, our $15,000 a year employee, up to $1,425 or roughly $119 a month for single coverage. Now, if we add that to our cost, we get a total maximum single premium that we can fit into this budget, this hypothetical budgeting process we've done, of about $582 per month for single coverage. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and just buy single coverage for all your employees and, and plan on being able to, to, to pay no more than $582. But this serves as a way of working through the math and comparing the actual cost of the penalty to the actual cost of health insurance. Now, remember we talked about in order to avoid that $2,000 penalty, we have to offer what is referred to as MEC, minimum essential coverage. But we didn't talk about what MEC really is. Well, when we read the Affordable Care Act, what we know is that fully insured health carriers are required to include in their health benefits a list of 10 types of health care that are referred to as essential health benefits, and that those benefits can have no lifetime maximums. Those 10 categories include things like doctors, uh, coverage, hospital, prescriptions, and so forth. And the effect of that is the Affordable Care Act has really told the health insurance industry, you, you're going to have to sell major medical type coverage, which means uh, health insurance carriers are going to have to comply with that it also means that the old generation uh, mini-med plans will not meet that standard. And I'm sure that that's of no news uh, to all of you. That's, that uh, fact has been out there for a long time. That's what it means for fully insured plans. But for self-insured employers, or really a better term might be partially self-insured, there is a very different and very interesting definition of MEC. Um, the Affordable Care Act really says for, for employers that self-insure or partially self-insure that their plans must uh, comply with ERISA, which is a federal law governing employee benefits, and the Public Health Services Act. So when we look at ERISA, what we find really is no definition of what kind of benefits have to be included. In fact, ERISA really concerns itself more with things like plan documentation, giving notice to employees, employee appeals rights, uh, and, and other uh, proceedings. So we look to the Public Health Services Act, and what we find there is that the only real minimum standard is to provide a plan that includes preventive care, 
with no cost sharing. In other words, 100% coverage for preventive care, things like routine physicals and immunizations and so forth. Well, this is the concept that has given birth to the term skinny plan. Uh, many of you probably read or heard about the article that was in the Wall Street Journal now a couple of months ago talking about these bare bones or skinny plans. And this is the type of plan they're talking about, a self-insured preventive-only plan does meet the MEC provisions, and the IRS has actually uh, said so. Uh, we believe there is a potential place for these plans in the staffing industry and certain other ind industries. Uh, there is no, it, it is not a loophole. I want to make very clear the fact that the IRS has said that they don't have the authority to change that. It would take a law, and I don't know that Congress is uh, is willing to, to do more on, on these plans right now. So, But they may have a year or two-year uh, life cycle. We don't know. But for now, the IRS has said, yes, they'll meet minimum essential coverage standards. However, I would just urge you to be careful in looking at these plans. There are a lot of, I say a lot of, there are some marketers of these plans who um, um, are promoting these, and there are many legal and underwriting issues in the fine print that you really have to be careful of because when you do one of these plans and you self-insure, uh, all the liability is back on you. You no longer have an insurance company that is supplying an insured product that you can point to and say, well, they should have done this, they should have known. As a self-insured employer, the liability is on you, so be very careful. I urge you to work with a qualified broker or consultant to do the due diligence and to help you implement. Don't rely on... Uh, the, the product sellers to do this because, in general, the people that are promoting these are not brokers. They are insurance salespeople. They have a place in the market, but you want somebody who's representing you. So that's what MEC is. But, again, that takes you out of the $2,000 penalty. It does not take you out of the $3,000 penalty. To do that, we have to offer a plan that is minimum value. And that means that the benefits payable have to actuarially be determined to represent at least 60% of the plan's value. Uh, and that the out-of-pocket maximum, at least for next year, of that plan cannot exceed $6,350. In fact, minimum value plans have been indexed to health savings account qualified plans, what we call HDHPs, high deductible health plans. Uh, there are certain plan designs uh, that have been given safe harbor status so that if you choose one of those plan designs, you don't have to go through an actuarial calculation, or you can have the plan actuarially certified, or the Health and Human Services Department has actually put a calculator out there that your broker can use to make sure that your plan meets the minimum value standard. And one strategy that we have been using with many of our clients is to implement a minimum value plan that meets the affordability test to eliminate the potential of all penalties. We've actually, prior to the announcement of the delay, had put in place a number of these plans waiting for January 1st so we could enroll temps in them. And let me give you an example of what one of these plans might look like. Uh, perhaps a deductible of $5,000 could be a little bit more. Remember the out-of-pocket limit can be no more than $6,350. Uh, we could have a deductible that is that high, in fact. And for our hypothetical plan, and this is a hypothetical plan, although I will tell you that the, these plans and pricing I'm going to talk about are very representative of what we found in the market today. Uh, this particular plan priced out at $225 per month for single coverage. Um, if we have a, our lowest paid employee who uh, makes somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 an hour, maybe $19,000 a year, we would charge that employee 9.5% of that for his or her premium, single premium, or $150 a month, which means that our staffing client employer is responsible for the other $75 per month. And as you can see, even though that is obviously an increase in cost over zero, that that is much less 
than the types of costs of paying the penalty or even the, the insurance premium costs that we showed in our previous slides. So that's what minimum value might look like. That is a strategy uh, we think you should consider uh, for 2015 uh, and even for 2014 if, if you want to move forward with a plan in 2014. Now I'm going to touch on the look back rule only briefly um, because I, I hope by now each of you has a good basic understanding of the look back provisions. And as I said earlier, if, if not, and you want me to take questions on this, I'll be glad to address it. But there are a couple of points about the look-back rule that uh, I want to stress. Uh, first of all, the look-back rule was given to us really as an optional method for determining who is a full-time employee. But it applies only to variable hour employees. And when the look-back rule first came out just about a year ago, we really thought that the term variable hour employee was synonymous with temp. And that may be the case for in many, if not most, situations, but they are not the same term. Variable hour employees and temps are not all going to be the same. In fact, if you look at the definition of what a variable hour employee, you will, you will see that uh, it really depends on a facts and circumstances test, which means it has to be applied on an employee by employee basis, uh, initially on their start date, and if their status changes after the start date, you have to reclassify them. We did have a, um, a safe harbor rule that was given to us for 2014 that gave us a little more liberal interpretation of the look back uh, provisions, but that that safe harbor was uh, only for 2014. So it remains to be seen what, if any, changes to the look back provisions might come out um, for 2015. So I guess the point of this is know the definition of the variable hour employee uh, and make sure you're ready to apply it as I mentioned earlier, you're going to need to start tracking variable hour employees very, very shortly because now 2014 uh, becomes your look back period for 2015, and you don't want to wait until uh, December 31st of any given year to, to end your look back period because it's just not practical to think that you're going to be able to stop your look back on December 31st and add people to coverage January 1st. You need a, an administrative time period in between. So I think for staffing companies that probably means by this November 1st, uh, just a few months away, you need to be in a position to start tracking variable hour employees for next year. Uh, going forward, uh, and does that mean beginning 2014 or 2015? Um, you really need to be able to classify every new employee into one of three categories. Uh, are they full-time uh, at, at date of start? Yes or no. For example, if you hire a new payroll uh, person in, internally and they're, they're working 30 hours a week or more, obviously that is a full-time employee and they're going to have to be offered coverage within 90 days, and that's not within three months. Uh, so 90 days is going to be the hard and fast rule for offering coverage to full-time employees. If they're scheduled to be part-time, you are not required to offer coverage, but be careful if you do make part-time employees eligible for your benefits. There are separate limitations that you have to be aware of in terms of how long how many hours of service they can work before you make them eligible. If they're neither full-time or part-time, they're truly variable hour and you cannot tell, then you obviously want to be using your initial measurement period, your look-back period, um, and your administrative period combined can be no more, uh, can, excuse me, can go no longer than to the last day of the first calendar month beginning on or after the one year anniversary. So you get 13 months in a fraction for your uh, new hires before you have to add them to the plan. And after that, you will transition everybody into whatever your annual 
measurement periods are. So those are just some key points uh, on the look back provision uh, that I wanted to touch on. And again, if, if you want to get into more details about that, let me know. But I, I, I hope by now everybody had a good understanding of the look back provisions. As we all know, the qualifications for avoiding the penalties also includes the provision that health coverage that we provide meet the affordability test. Now, the affordability test that is written into the Affordable Care Act relates to what is known as MAGI, Modified Adjustable Gross Income. Well, there's no possible way that an employer can actually know what a family's modified adjustable gross income is. So the IRS said rely on box one uh, of the W-2 for, uh, for the employee's wages. Uh, but they gave us two additional safe harbors besides that because Box 1 W-2 doesn't always take into account uh, uh, employee deferrals for 401K and things like that. So the IRS said, well, we'll give you what is referred to now as the rate of pay safe harbor. And I think most employers are going to use this. The rate of pay safe harbor says if you use the employee's rate of pay at the beginning of the health plan year, and assume 130 hours per month, then you can base their monthly insurance cost on that number. Another safe harbor that was given is to use the federal poverty level as the base rate of pay for all employees. And the federal poverty level can be used based on whatever uh, the, the poverty level is that's been published as of the first day of the plan year. Now, in both of these two safe harbors, you may have picked up on the fact that I mentioned that whether it's the rate of pay or the federal poverty level, use that as of the first day of the plan year. That's an important term. The beginning of your plan year is the first day of your health insurance plan for that year. How do you know when that is? Well, one of the things that we're going to encourage you to do, and I think you really need to do, is make sure you have a plan document that uh, defines when your plan year is. Uh, there's no default plan year. Uh, the, the, in most cases, uh, employers that never define one uh, end up using a calendar year basis, but that's not necessarily the case. And you're going to need to know what your plan year is for various compliance reasons. What I would like you to do uh, is think about the fact that as staffing companies, you are accustomed to viewing for health plan and other employee benefit purposes, your internal staff or permanent employees as one category and your contingent workforce, your temps, your contractors as a second category of employees. Well, the ACA is designed, among other things, really to push uh, staffing companies, hospitality companies, and other companies that have had uh, non-standard employment arrangements into behaving more like your customers, uh, more like, and I, for lack of a better term, uh, to, to treat you like any other employer. That means that you want to shift your thinking to, to, to understand this to looking at all of your employees as either full-time, part-time, or variable hour employees. <clears throat> and again, in most cases, your temps are going to be variable hour, but not in all. So don't fall into that trap. Well, what do we do? Uh, how do we get to that point? Well, the process is you, you want to make sure that you are looking at your current employee benefit programs for your internal staff and your temps, if any, and make sure you have a process to move toward ACA compliance readiness sometime in 2014 for no later than January 1, 2015. Now, you can see that I've scratched out the target date of July or August. We actually had really been uh, loudly trumpeting the horn with staffing companies before the delay, saying you need to have things in place by the end of this summer. Um, 
we still really encourage you to be ready as soon as possible. Um, I don't, I can't give you a date, uh, uh, but sooner works better than later, I promise you, because you're going to see an enormous scramble in about 12 months. Indeed, we were beginning to see a, a, an enormous scramble uh, in June and July uh, for staffing companies to start putting plans in place. The problem is uh, there aren't any more of us uh, on the insurance side to handle the increased volume. So we were beginning to see uh, really thin resources for what we saw uh, a third and fourth quarter of enormous transactional activity. And I really don't want you to get caught into that. So planning sooner rather than later will, I promise you, benefit you uh, in the outlaw. Obviously, you have to be able to deal with your customers on this issue. And paramount is that you need to have confidence that you know what your costs are so you know that they're going to be covered. This is not one of those uh, expense items that you want to guess on and miss. Uh, if you estimate your costs will be $0.08 cents per billable hour and they turn out to be $0.15 cents per billable hour, you're sunk unless you've got substantial margin to cover that. On the other hand, if you uh, over budget um, and your competition nails it, you may price yourself out of some business. So the good news for you is that your cost will almost certainly be much lower than your customers' costs. And I'd like to give you an illustration of exactly what I mean. And perhaps you've done something similar, but if you haven't done the math, um, jot these down. The national average for a PPO plan single rate uh, last year, and it hasn't changed significantly in the last several months, is about $450 per month. And again, that's single coverage, national average for PPO health insurance. So if we annualize that number, the annual expense for single coverage is $5,400. Typically, employers, and I'm talking about your customers, will share insurance costs by paying about 80% of the premium and asking employees to pay 20%. So if we look at your customer's 80% share, assuming they fall into the average, then 80% of that $5,400 number is $4,320. When we do the math and divide that out for a 40-hour-a-week full-time employee, that comes out to be a little over $2 and a nickel per hour. Uh, so what I'm really saying here is most of your customers uh, are paying at a minimum a payroll burden north of $2 an hour for health insurance. Many of them also contribute toward family in, uh, coverage, and that, this doesn't even account for that. It's not unusual for us to see, depending on the industry that you're serving, your customers paying between 6 and $8 per hour just for the corporate share of health insurance. Well, your customers don't have variable hour employees. They don't have a lot of hours for employees who never qualify for health insurance like you will have. So they don't have those hours to distribute their costs against. You do. Uh, in fact, your customers, as they learn more about the Affordable Care Act, uh, they're looking for help. They don't like the idea of adding to full-time headcount, you know that. You hear that from them. Uh, they're looking for ways to minimize their, their cost of dealing with the ACA, and part of that is not adding to full-time headcount. So as I mentioned, as I'm sure you, you've all figured out by now, this is one of the opportunities you have. There's some special considerations that I want to touch on that may or may not apply to you, but because I deal with so many staffing companies all across the United States, uh, I run into these, and they can be real red flags. If you are engaged in any government contracting, and I'm speaking specifically of doing Service Contract Act work, um, then you know you're required to pay prevailing wage and a fringe allowance. Uh, in such case, I, I really suggest you consider not delaying until January 1, 2015, 
expanding coverage at least to those Service Contract Act workers. And the reason I say that is uh, you may take yourself out of being eligible for the contract and losing the contract because technically you're going to be out of compliance with the Affordable Care Act. Um, I, I, I can't say that with 100% certainty, but I think you should consider it carefully. The same goes if you're doing work for any of the counties or cities that have livable wage requirements. The city of San Francisco, for example, has its own requirements. So there are certain uh, situations where uh, delaying until 2015 may not be a good idea. Also, ask yourself whose employees uh, are they? Um, the IRS, as I'm sure you know, has determined that we use the common law employment definition for determining who the employer of record is. Uh, I have seen situations where some of my staffing company's clients actually had their employees under a customer's plan, and that is an enormous issue for you if you have that, because you could have your customer calling the shots on determining what uh, what agent or broker is being used and what insurance carrier is being selected, the plan design, those are all decisions that um, not only you should be making, but you have the legal and fiduciary liability for. Uh, also, if you're doing any payrolling, there are great risks with that, so please be aware of that. Uh, it does make a difference in these situations, so if, if you're in any of those particular uh, situations, I want you to be aware of it. Uh, be careful, talk to your broker about it, and make sure that you're not inadvertently putting yourself, either now or in the future, out of compliance. There's a lot of administration. I'm sure this is not news to you, um, but I want to kind of touch uh, on the high points here. Make sure that uh, you think about when you kick uh, this expansion of coverage off, taking employee deductions for their share of the insurance. Uh, not only do you have to determine how much you're going to charge employees per paycheck, but when do you start taking deductions? Your health insurance agreement is with the insurance company and you. Uh, your employees are uh, associated with it, but the Blue Cross, Blue Shields, Cigna's, Aetna's, United Healthcare's of the world are going to look to you for premium payment. They don't really care if when premium is due uh, that you have not been able to collect the employee's share. The, the payment for premium uh, lies squarely on the employer's shoulder. So I advise my clients to take premium deductions in advance. Yes, you can do that. It is legal. I don't know of any jurisdiction uh, in which it is not permissible. Uh, you don't want to take them too far in advance, but I would see uh, f you know, up to four weeks in advance so that you have uh, kind of a working reserve. Therefore, if an employee misses a paycheck, you still have premium to pay. And by the way, if they don't pay their premium because they're off uh, of an assignment for a while, you are entitled to cancel their health insurance coverage uh, if they don't pay the bill. You are permitted to do that. <clears throat> Beginning um, in 2014, as I mentioned earlier, make sure that you have an understanding of the variable hour employee definition and treat each employee as either full-time, part-time, or variable hour. Your software companies uh, should be in a position to do this. If you don't work with one of the software companies that has the tracking mechanism and the ability to classify employees, you're going to need some type of, of a workaround uh, to get this done, because you've got to be able to track hours, employee status, breaks in service, uh, which means you're going to want to have things like alarms and monitors uh, in a system to alert you when an employee becomes eligible, when to offer them coverage, and so forth. We will look, obviously, for the reporting requirements that are going to be coming out for the uh, IR Internal Revenue Code sections that have been delayed. Um, so keep an eye on that because um, that will give us a lot of details. But in the meantime, I want you to be aware that you will need to be able to track who is actually covered for health insurance, what the cost-sharing arrangements are, you'll, because you're going to have to report this. 
uh, employees' names and Social Security numbers. Um, some of this is actually going to have to be done for W-2 reporting. Uh, for example, you're going to need to be able to report in Box 12, I believe it is, the uh, total value of health insurance for each employee. So if you have an employee, for example, who doesn't go on the health plan until February, and at that time they take single-only coverage, and then a few months later they get married, and let's say that the individual to whom they've become married has a child, and some months down the line that child needs to be covered because the former spouse no longer covers it, you could have an employee who goes from single coverage to employee plus spouse to family coverage at different times during the year. You're going to have to be able to report the, the value of that actual premium based on the dates those changes were made uh, throughout the year. Uh, and, and most employers have never thought about that. You've got to have some type of a tracking mechanism to be able to do that. Also, be aware of control group provisions. If you have multiple companies under common control, different rules apply to you. There is a big issue depending on the states that you operate in because Medicaid is expanded in certain states which can actually take employees off of your eligibility rolls. So there will be certain vendors that will come out that will help you for a fee determine who's eligible for Medicaid you're going to want to make sure that each employee who's eligible for health benefits either enrolls or waives or goes on Medicaid. There are certain provisions in the law we just are uncertain of when they're going to kick in. There is an auto-enrollment provision, for example, that is going to require employers to automatically add employees to a health benefit plan. If that doesn't get changed, that could be in 2015. There are non-discrimination rules that are part of this law that have not been issued yet and therefore won't be uh, assessed uh, until they are issued. We do not know if that's going to be coming in 2014, 2015, maybe never. Uh, also, understand small employer versus large employer differences for the Affordable Care Act because it makes a difference in terms of reporting and administration of a number of employee benefit issues. For example, there are uh, certain employers today who don't have to comply with COBRA. You may have state continuation laws, but COBRA kicks in at a certain employee size. Um, ERISA reporting kicks in at a certain size, which means you have to file another form with the government called a Form 5500. There are Medicare secondary payer laws that you may be unaware of that are going to affect you because the definition of full-time employee is changing, which means the headcount for how many full-time employees you have is changing, and so on. Uh, there's still a lot of employee communications that you're going to have to deal with internally. Beware of doing those communications electronically because there are legal requirements that you have to comply with that are very difficult uh, standards to meet. So in most cases, you're going to want to be dealing with paper handing out those notices. The big issue is what's the cost going to be? Um, and we're going to talk about that uh, in, in just a few minutes uh, and how you can get your handle around that. But other provisions that affect your actual cost include remembering the fact that you only have to offer one affordable compliant plan. Uh, so offering it may or may not add to your costs. What's really going to add to your cost is the employees that actually take the coverage. And if you don't offer coverage and you choose to go the penalty route, and in, in all honesty, I have not yet seen, except for the very, very smallest employers, situations where the penalty makes sense financially. But if, you, if you're one of those, keep in mind that the $2,000 penalty is indexed to health care costs, and it will be going up. We also expect that the individual mandate penalty will be going up. Uh, the administration has already caught on to the fact that there may be a lot of people who simply choose not to buy health insurance because the individual penalty is so low. So I would not be surprised if in order to drive those people onto employer plans that we see an attempt to get that individual penalty raised. 
Questions that I get oftentimes include, will I be allowed to continue or to have different plans for my workforce? And yes, uh, you can have multiple health plans. Can you have separate plans for your internal staff and your temps? Well, today uh, that is permissible because we don't have any non-discrimination rules that prohibit it. Until those rules come out, then yes, but at some point, Almost certainly no. A big part of the, the reason for this law was to really drive employers to treat uh, all full-time workers the same. So I don't expect we've got a long history to look forward to of having separate uh, plans. However, you can, as an employer, uh, provide supplemental benefits for your internal staff and executives. Uh, talk to your broker about those. There are ways that you can uh, supplement their deductibles. If you want to go to a high deductible plan, for example, for your entire uh, workforce, including temps, but then have a separate supplemental plan for your corporate staff or your executives, you can do that. Uh, it, it just has to be done the right way. And something that's rarely talked about, uh, but should be thought of, I think, in, in many situations, is the fact that you can provide uh, premium differences uh, to your employees in the form of wellness incentives. Uh, now, you can't take uh, their affordability down below 9.5% of their income, but you can in encourage uh, healthy behaviors. And believe me, uh, if you are an employer that really wants to take control of health benefits as a cost, risk manage it like it was workers' comp, and that includes implementing some type of wellness plan. Now, in terms of looking at the cost, uh, I thought I would share with you some screenshots of a report that our agency has developed for our clients and how we predict costs for uh, various options under the Affordable Care Act. So you should have your broker uh, do the same type uh, of reports that I'm going to show you. <clears throat> and I'm going to spend just a few minutes on these screenshots. Uh, this particular a uh, hypothetical staffing company is a, is a large staffing company with $65 million in revenue. Uh, the first column is their current uh, expense and revenue situation. The second column assumes health benefits are offered uh, and 25% of the workforce take the benefits. And the third column is uh, no health benefits are offered. This employer is going to pay the penalty. And if you work your way down these columns, you can see the very bottom line is the impact on this particular staffing company's bill rate. And what you can see is for this particular client, at a 25% participation level for health insurance, the bill rate impact is $0.07 cents an hour. The penalty rate is $0.87 cents per hour. Now, if we change that participation rate to 50%, the penalty amount doesn't change because the penalty is fixed. We know what it is. It's still $0.87 cents per hour in this particular situation. But now this employer's share of health benefits goes from $0.07 cents an hour to $0.23 cents an hour by changing participation. And if we go to 75% participation, this particular staffing company goes to $0.31 cents an hour. Um, we run these scenarios for our clients, and we can run them at 10%, 20%, 50%, 100%, whatever. We can change the, uh, the plan designs that are built into this, but we actually use this. This is a tool your broker should be able to, to use with you to help you establish your, your, your uh, strategic planning. What is my worst-case scenario? Uh, just a heads up, uh, don't count on these. Uh, hourly rates for your own uh, business. We have seen uh, rates as low as a penny per hour and as high as about 90 cents per hour. It's all across the board. It's very, very individualized based on the staffing company, the, the amount of turnover and the space you're in and so forth. So a couple of last slides before we get into questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about health insurance options that are or will be available for temps. We've talked about minimum essential coverage. These are the skinny plans. Remember, those will be available. They are available, but they are going to be self-insured or partially self-insured. Not that that should scare you away. We're talking about uh, covering preventive services only. That is a very low financial risk. 
probably the most expensive procedure that would ever fall under a preventive-only plan is a colonoscopy. So it's, it's not going to be a high-cost option. Um, the minimum value and buy-up to minimum value, which is a major medical insurance, uh, is going to be available either on the exchange or group insurance basis for, for you. We've never seen uh, major medical for employers available on a program basis. That means, uh, for example, the off-the-shelf mini-med plans are program plans. Um, those rates tend to be fixed based on everybody who buys them, not just the employer. That's not the way group insurance works for major medical. Uh, we could see programs uh, develop, but in today's U.S. insurance market, they simply don't exist. Um, I want to mention the role of limited benefit or mini-med plans. There, there is going to be a continued place for these types of plans. Uh, I urge you to be just careful in the, how you use them. Make sure you don't put yourself in a compliance uh, trap. They can be used to supplement uh, other offerings, and frankly, if you will use a vendor that will give you good, uh, useful claims and utilization data, and I'm not just talking, uh, there, there is uh, data that you can get from some of these vendors that is just worthless, but some of the vendors can give you reports that your broker can use for pre-underwriting, and the value to that is when you do expand coverage and have to offer major medical to your temps, if you're able to give the major medical underwriter a good peek under the hood that is useful to them for underwriting purposes, if it's good data, uh, you can get some discounts on your insurance for that. If not, underwriters are terribly conservative. Uh, they will give you, they will always assume that everybody has cancer or some other dread disease and they'll price your plan accordingly. So there is a, a potential case there if your broker knows how to do this and, and can use it as a pre-underwriting strategy. And we've gotten a lot of mileage with the major medical underwriters uh, with certain um, limited benefit medical plans. Some staffing companies I know don't have benefits in place today for not only their temps, but also not for their, their internal staff. Uh, in such cases, we refer to that as a virgin group. Um, I would just really encourage you to not wait, if you're in that position, not wait until January 1, 2015. The process of putting a new group insurance plan in place can be lengthy and very cumbersome. And when the insurance markets are very, very slow these days. So if you're in that situation, start early. Um, and then, of course, consider how you're going to deal with the questions the health insurance carriers are going to challenge you with, the underwriting challenges. Certain variables um, are going to have to be tackled, such as how much are you as an employer going to contribute versus the employees. We know what the affordability test is. You're going to have to really deal with uh, the fact that depending on the plans you choose, you can only charge the employee so much. That means the rest of it is your contribution. Um, if you don't have coverage for your workers or until you, you get coverage for your temps, things like your workers' comp, uh, mod factor, the industries that you're presently serving, and ways to forecast or, or reveal the health status of your temporary workers are big underwriting considerations for those major medical carriers. So have a strategy for how or, or you and your broker sit down and have a strategy for how they're going to present uh, your particular set of circumstances to the health insurance market and anticipate that these are going to be obstacles that can be overcome, but what they really mean is uh, how much is the price going to be impacted. Be prepared in advance to deal with those. Last couple of slides, uh, I want to help increase your health insurance IQ. Uh, the health insurance market in the United States today is uh, governmental, that is things like Medicare and Medicaid, um, or we have the, the middle two, their small group and large group are employer-based plans. Those are mainly handled through the health insurance carriers. 
small group that is up to 100 employees in most states is a very highly regulated category of insurance business. Uh, the large group and the self-funded employer category is less regulated. The third class of type of market that we have is individual insurance. Uh, this is today in insurance that we just go to our health insurance agent and, or insurance agent and buy health insurance. In the future, they'll also be available on the exchanges. Well, the Affordable Care Act really kind of superimposes some new categories for us. Now, I want you to be aware of this, that under the Affordable Care Act, you're either a small employer or a large employer, and it has nothing to do with how the insurance companies categorize you today in their small group or large group segment. Uh, if you have 50 or more full-time equivalents, as we've talked about, and I'm sure you know, under the Affordable Care Act, you are a large employer. Um, so the health insurance companies, uh, and maybe even your brokers, may not have a good snapshot of your entire business. So they may see only your internal employee workforce and categorize you inappropriately as a small employer when you're actually a large employer. You need to know and you need to be able to communicate or have your broker communicate to the health insurance carriers whether you're a large employer or not because ultimately you as the employer are still the, the responsible party for complying with the Affordable Care Act. And there are different uh, compliance issues that apply to large employers related to health insurance as opposed to small employers. And if you are mistakenly categorized as a small employer by your health insurance carrier, you could inadvertently find yourself out of compliance with the Affordable Care Act. So know this, know whether you're small or large, and uh, make sure that your insurance carrier understands that. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be restricted to the types of plans you can purchase uh, unnecessarily. You may buy a more expensive plan than you need to, and you may be subjecting yourself to more market regulations than you need to be subjected to. Uh, my last points um, are going to be strategic. Uh, I really encourage you to rely heavily on your broker in a very, very strategic way uh, and choose who your broker is carefully. Hopefully you've already done that. But make sure uh, your broker understands your business. In the past, uh, being a broker for health insurance didn't really require any specific industry knowledge. Uh, that's different. Uh, your broker really needs to know the staffing business as well as the Affordable Care Act in order to serve you well. Um, make sure they're a true broker. I see a lot of staffing companies working with uh, product sellers, insurance agents that sell and represent certain plans. A true broker has uh, the ability and is, in fact, doing what I call core employee benefits. That's group major medical for internal staff. They also do um, a variety of insurance. They have underwriting and financial analysis capabilities and they should have the entire universe of options available to you. So don't restrict yourself to an insurance agent that really represents a particular product or just a handful of products. Make sure they can do financial modeling and different scenarios so that you can get a handle on the cost impact of different options, whether it involves offering insurance or taking the penalty route. Um, then you can set your budget. And that will allow your broker, ultimately, then once you have a budget set, make sure your broker reverse engineers a health benefits package inside your budget. And a strategic approach to this would be to manage the actual benefit cost to a point below your budget. One of the advantages, there are very few advantages that the Affordable Care Act brings to the staffing industry. But one of the advantages that it's going to bring is this gives you an opportunity to adjust your bill rate and, frankly, to improve your margin if you're strategic about this. And you can actually manage your health benefit cost well. Uh, you can grow your margin. Uh, you should be in a partnership with your broker to do that. Your broker should be able to do that. You can actually turn your health benefit plan, your health insurance plan, into a profit center. So my closing comments before we open it up for questions is 
do not wait. I cannot encourage you strongly enough to not take the next year off. If, if you could see what we see in terms of the amount of work to be done, um, you, you'd, ha- you'd feel the fire underneath you. A lot of the projects that, that your broker and that you need to do are going to take months, not days or weeks, but months to do. Most immediately, if you have a health reimbursement arrangement, an HRA, find out if you need to make a filing because the filing deadline may be coming up for July 31st. Be ready to distribute your exchange notice prior to October 1st, not on October 1st, but prior to. Make sure that you have variable tracking uh, in place probably no later than November 1st. Uh, Most importantly, don't stop your strategic planning. Um, As I mentioned, there can be months involved in some of these projects uh, to do the financial modeling, to do a compliance review and audit, uh, and even renewals uh, today are taking an enormous amount of time. It's it's not unusual for us to to market, go to market for our clients, and the markets themselves may take uh, six weeks to 12 weeks to turn quote requests around from start to finish. That's a very, very long time, so you can't wait until the last minute to do it. And then, of course, consider if you want to implement something in 2014 uh, or wait until 1-1 of 15, which I think most staffing companies will undoubtedly do. I cannot encourage anybody to spend money before they have to. But certainly get your strategy set in terms of dealing with others like your customers uh, and so forth. So we've come up uh, with where we've got about 15 minutes left for questions and answers. Um, I'm going to ask Amanda to come back in at this point and uh, moderate any questions she has. Great. So the floor is open for questions. Um, Please go ahead and use the Q&A section for questions. Um, I do have a couple here that have come in. One is, I'm unclear on variable employees versus static employees. Um, We are unsure how long most of our assignments will last. How will that affect how we treat new hires? Well, the, the issue is the definition of a variable hour employee, um, and I would encourage you to get your hands on that. Your, your broker should be able to provide it. I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of an off-the-cuff definition, but a variable hour employee is someone that at date of hire, based on the facts and circumstances of that individual, you cannot reasonably determine whether they're expected to work 30 hours a week or more on an ongoing basis. And for a lot of you, that's going to be most, if not all, of your temps because you don't know the duration of the assignments. But uh, the, the key here in 2015 is not the length of the assignment, it's the, the hours per week because beginning in 2015, we're not going to be permitted to take the length of an assignment into account. You're going to have to assume um, if an employee has an assignment of 30 hours a week or more that that assignment is going to be ongoing. And if it is within 30 or excuse me within 90 days, you're going to have to flip them from being a variable hour classified employee to a full-time employee. So uh, it's not going to be easy. This is where your software vendor really has to play a role. You've got to be able to, you want to make the classification up front. But I cannot stress enough that this is a facts and circumstances test. You can't automatically assume that each temp you hire is going to be variable hour. Maybe they will be for your particular business. But I also have several staffing company clients that have some customers that have long-term assignments. So it's going to depend. But a variable hour employee really is somebody that you say when you hire them, I don't know what, what, that they're going to work 30 hours a week on an ongoing basis. And if you can say that in all certainty, uh, then they're a variable hour employee until, uh, until they get through the, the look back or, or measurement period. Okay. Uh, what participation rates were your insurance premium examples based on? Well, the participation rates that I showed you were uh, 25% in one example, 
uh, 50% and another in 75%. Uh, the, if the question really is driven at do the, do the rates change based on participation, uh, the, the answer is yes, they do, uh, not significantly. As the participation percentage goes up, you do have a little bit better rate. Um, and if you get to 100% participation, you get the lowest rate. And we've actually run multiple scenarios where we assume the employer paid 100% of the premium, therefore we had 100% participation, and that, that dropped the rate the most. But uh, I, hope, I hope that answered that question. I hope I understood the question properly. And b by the way, going back to the last question, I did not touch on uh, an internal employee um, situation. I would expect that all uh, of you who hire a new internal employee, that would just automatically be a full-time employee. So, uh, again, I, I want to stress that beginning next year, full-time is 30 hours a week or more, and they're either going to be full-time, part-time, or variable hour. Think in those three buckets. Uh, and most internal employees are we today consider permanent employees, therefore they're going to be full-time employees, I would assume. Okay. If we have all of our temps that won't work full-time for more than 90 days, do we have any risk? So if, if every one of your temps will not work, maybe a better way to say it, if none of your temps will work full-time longer than 90 days, no, you, you have no added risk uh, because you have up until 90 days to add somebody to a plan, and the IRS is on record as saying nobody will be penalized for not adding somebody in the first 90 days. So if you've got that situation, you're fine. Uh, but be, just be careful that you're not uh, – if that's your normal course of business, great. You're in terrific shape. But we also have had a number of warnings come out of uh, Treasury saying that if, if employers are changing their employment practices – specifically to avoid complying with this law, then you're going to make yourself a target for, for uh, uh, enforcement. Okay. Does your firm have a sample letter to give new employees to accept or reject insurance coverage? Well, we haven't developed it yet. Uh, we will uh, be developing that. So if you're a client of our firm, uh, we'll, we'll have that available. Um, but we don't have something yet. We, we, uh, we recognize the need for that, and uh, frankly, we were waiting to see what the exchange notice said and what the insurance carriers developed, but we'll have something. Okay. You mentioned that staffing firms should have a variable hour tracking system in place by this year. Do you have any suggestions on what systems to use? Well, <clears throat> If, if you're using uh, one of the software companies that is, is prominent in staffing, uh, they really should be on top of this. Um, I'm not in a position to endorse any of those. I mean, uh, offline, if, if, especially if you're a client of ours, I'd be happy to talk to you about who you're using and what knowledge we may have uh, of where they are. Um, but there are going to be options out there. Um, many of the payroll uh, services, uh, all the payroll services really should be able to do it. So if you're using one of them, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I would prefer, the, you know, rather than me mention any of the software companies by name, uh, because that, that could be taken as endorsement, that that be a, a separate conversation. I, I apologize, but I just I don't want to step on anybody. Okay. Uh, I have another one that's saying, I think it would be considered a small employer. Will I still need to come up with and distribute a model exchange notice? If not, will I need to notify my temps that I am not required to offer insurance because we are considered a small employer? Very good question. Uh, and I'm glad that somebody asked the question. Whether you are a small employer or a large employer, um, you will be required, you are required to distribute the model exchange notice to your entire workforce. So 
Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're small or not. And if you're not going to be offering coverage, uh, there is a separate th that that is indicated on the exchange notice. So there's a place for you to do that. So I hope I hope I do I miss any part of the question, Amanda? No, I, I think that covered that. All right. Okay. So my next question is: Would an HSA plan be an eligible plan? The cost seems to be less than other plans and still remains, I believe, within the criteria defined. So that's a good question, and I think by using the term HSA, uh, what we're really talking about is an HSA compliant plan. The HSA technically is the account itself, a health savings account. The, the health plan we refer to as an HDHP, a high deductible health plan. If you have, the, the long and the short of it is, if your health plan is compatible with an HSA, yes, it should be considered a qualified plan because the out-of-pocket maximums for, an, for a uh, minimum value plan are tied to those types of plans. And the, the questioner is absolutely correct. They are going to be much less costly. In fact, they're, they're basically going to be the lowest cost type minimum value plans available. And that is where we have seen the majority of our clients uh, look is uh, high deductible health plans that qualify for HSAs as that minimum value option. Okay. And then how is the percentage calculated when earnings include base and commission? Is the amount supposed to be consistent monthly or does it vary depending on wages? Well, it, it, the answer depends on which method you use to, to peg your affordability test to. Remember, you have the option of either using box one W-2 wages, in which case I would expect that would include both base and commissions. Um, or for hourly employees, you can use their hourly rate at the beginning of the plan year and assume 130 hours. Now, for salaried employees, if we're talking about salaried, you simply divide the salary uh, amount uh, in, you know, create a monthly uh, amount and then base it on that. So uh, it, it really depends if, if you're going to use the box one uh, fallback, uh, everything that goes into that counts. If you're, if you're talking about an hourly employee who could earn commissions, um, then you know, you, you really have to look at the hourly rate uh, at the beginning of the plan year, and that doesn't that doesn't anticipate commissions because commissions really can't be guaranteed. Um, so what some staffing companies are planning on doing is looking at actual earnings by pay period and just saying, I'm going to charge 9.5% of whatever you make, and if that's made up of a combination of salary and commissions, great. The, the only two rules you have are you can't exceed 9.5% for single coverage, and you can't charge the employee more than the actual cost of insurance. So you have to be able to cap the employee's cost, uh, not only, I mean, if they're a high earner and 9.5% of their earnings equals or exceeds the insurance premium, you have to be able to cap it at the insurance premium. Okay. If my measurement period shows I have 50 full-time employees that I need to offer health insurance, 20 of the workers decline the offer, I choose to pay the penalty, the first 30 are exempt, meaning I do not need to pay anything and still in compliance. Could, could you read that one more time? Sure. So if the measurement period shows I have 50 full-time employees that you need to offer health insurance for, 20 employees decline to accept the offer. She then chooses to pay the penalty. The first 30 are exempt, so then she would not need to pay any penalty and still would be compliant? Well, here, here's the way the, the pay or play option will go. You, you have to choose... Uh, whether or not you're, you're going to pay the penalty or offer coverage. You're not going to know how many uh, employees choose coverage until you've made the offer. And I think that what's embedded in the question there is if after the fact 
you find that you have 20 employees who decline uh, and you know you're going to have 30 uh, free if you pay the penalty because the 20 client decline, can I take them off? And, and the answer is no. You, if you pay the penalty, you look at your 50 full-time and you take 30 off of that number, and so you'd pay the penalty on 20. Uh, and the penalty will actually be assessed on a monthly basis. So you, you won't really know until after you've made an offer of insurance how many employees are going to take the coverage, but that number isn't going to be a, a variable anyway. You can't take those, those employees off if you're paying the penalty. So I, I, okay. I hope, hope I answered the question. I hope I understood the question correctly. Yeah, no, it sounds like you did. If we decide to play and offer insurance, but our attempts turn down the insurance, will there be no penalty fees incurred by the company? The short answer is yes, uh, assuming that by playing, you're offering a minimum value plan that meets the affordability test. And if you do that, then and nobody signs up, you're off the hook, no penalties. Okay. Can you still change your option monthly as to whether you want to pay or play, or is there value in this? And if so, how difficult would it be to assess how how you would do so? Well, the penalties are not going to be are, are going to be assessed and paid on a monthly basis, but the reporting is going to be after the fact. I don't think it. I don't know, to be honest with you, if you're allowed to to make that choice on a monthly basis or not. I think the practicality is I don't know how you would do that. I don't know how you would be able to offer coverage one month and the next month say I'm not offering coverage. I'm going to pay the penalties. Um, for one thing, the insurance carriers are are not going to be required to go through. Uh, an on-again, off-again offer throughout the year. So I, I think you, you really need to make this decision up front in whatever it is, stick with it. Okay, great. Um, if there are any other questions, please go ahead and submit them at this time. I did open up the poll, so if you could provide us your feedback, we'd certainly appreciate that. And I'll wait and see if anything else comes um, and for as far as questions, we'll go ahead and put up the contact information slide. Please feel free to, to reach out to either of us if you have um, any questions or like any additional information. I'd like to thank all of our participants um, for joining today's webinar as well as John for sharing his knowledge about the employer mandate delay and the Affordable Care Act. We will have the recording available on our website at tricom.com slash resources. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on next month's webinar session held on August 22nd regarding applicant tracking software solutions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. It doesn't look like there are any other questions, so thanks again, John. My pleasure. Have a good day. You too.